Welcome to Inside the Firm, a podcast dedicated to small business owners and hosted by entrepreneurs, Alex Gore and Lance Psycho. Each week, they take you on their journey of how to start, run, and grow a business by bringing you inside their architecture and real estate development firm. Get a behind the scenes tour of how these business leaders manage their clients and foster company culture while creating new and innovative projects. And now your host, Alex Gore and Lance Psycho. Welcome to another episode of Inside the Firm. I am Alex L- Pella Luxury Division Gore. I'm number here. one, number one. Yep, I'm here with a, I don't even know because like I'm so caught up on myself. It might be <laughs> uh, Lance Sieko, Lance Sieko. How do you say it? Psycho. Science Psycho. That's what I've heard Lance Psycho. Yep. Well, <clears throat> before we get into that, uh, Lance and I were talking. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're going to talk about uh, how to prepare for the next recession, um, which which may or may not be the headline, um, just because it. it I, I think I won't go into it because we don't know how it's going to happen, and we predict this for a long time. But like I think there could be something severe between 2022 and 2026. Yeah. Um, if you haven't read the book, The Fourth Turning, I highly recommend it. Yep. And even going to like, <clears throat> I just want to go to the extreme. Because let's say there is a civil war, not that I'm saying there is. What people forget is like during wartime, like the economy still goes, even one that you're currently in. We all watch those movies where you highlight what's happening on the battlefield. But like outside the battlefield, two miles down, that town is still running, still doing stuff in World War II, Vietnam, you know, unless you're utterly destroying a building. So what I'm getting at is this is a, a plug for our course, Architect to Builder, because once the finances are set in that bank, it still rolls unless it gets extremely crazy. So if you're thinking about just building a bigger foundation for your firm, a stronger foundation for your firm, it might be something you want to look into. Um, and it's even in a good economy, it's it's still a positive thing to do to have a bigger foundation for your firm, a stronger foundation for your firm. Architect's Guide 2. It's to.com. It's the architect to builders course. Go check it out for yourself. Oh, another plug. Sorry, Lance Seiko. Listen to Alex. A contractor. Look at me just hold this post. Hold it the whole time. A contractor. He went to school to be an architect from my hometown in Rochester. His dad got sick. Something happened. He had to take over the contractor business. He's now 50. He's getting back into architecture. He, he stated, he's like, why? I wanted to get a program that I could model like it gets built. And he goes, I thought that was Revit. And he got a bunch of training from a bunch of different individuals, even paid people to make some templates, even paid some people to consult with him. And finally I said, like, he wanted to come out. He'll come out and meet with us next week sometime. But I was like, I think you're looking for RevitRocketship.com. And he goes, he called me up and just ranted and raved. How are people not thinking this way how are they not modeling this way what a great what is going on he's like my differentiator is like i know how to construct a house so that's how i want to model a house he and it was so much like he's he was a little bit of a talker but he's like i kind of want to end this conversation to go back and watch like i'm stuck on these videos so cool yeah so uh check i know it wasn't in the notes to promote that but that's revit rocketship.com it's 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 hard for us to convey how meaningful we think this way of yeah. modeling is. You just gotta take you gotta you gotta take a leap. Yep. There you go. Take a leap, get on that rocket. Uh another thing you should check out is ArcCat with project conditions changing and limited time to get things done. It's good to have information at your fingertips. ArcCat.com provides architects, engineers, spec writers, and contractors with the most comprehensive libraries of building product content and designed so you can access it quickly and efficiently. Even better, ArcCat.com is free to use and requires no registration. That's my favorite part. So visit today and access the information you need now. Arcat.com, A-R-C-A-T.com. Start building better content today. Support them because they support us. All right. Uh, this episode is also brought to you by Pella Luxury. But you hey. have never experienced a brand like this before. The collection of brands within the luxury division of Pella are the conversation starters, the pioneers of the industry who provide window and or solutions to discerning architects, the building industry, and beyond. They have decades of experience creating things no one else in the world is creating. 
and the collection of brands are brought together to complement and build on one another. They don't push beyond the limits. They set them. Explore PellaLuxury.com forward slash the firm. That's PellaLuxury.com forward slash the firm. If you go to that link, just know you are doing us a huge solid by supporting Pella Luxury. Even if you're not using their products, you might use them in the future. So check out that link. They support us so we can help support you. Back to you, Mr. Pella Luxury, Gore. Okay, Lance has a rant. So prepare yourself for a rant. It's your uncle's 30 year of experience doesn't mean blank to me and shouldn't to you either. Your uncle's 30 years of experience, I'm here to tell you, doesn't mean to me and it shouldn't to you either. So if you people, what one thing I've noticed that becomes a pattern be, be, between professional, just in this business, for some reason, whether you're an architect, whether you're a builder, whether you're an engineer, um, maybe even, I don't hear this too much from, from clients. Go ahead. I was going to say, if you're a plumber, if you're a coder, if your uncle is in the same business or aunt that you're going to get services from, like, just just think if, like, I don't know, shouldn't have got that computer, shouldn't have used that plumber, shouldn't, you know, like, every profession. It's yeah. not just our profession. Yeah. So I think one thing that people fall a victim to right away is they just buy this, once they hear this puffing of the chest from other people about, well, I've been doing this for 10 years. I've been doing this for 20 years. I've been doing this for 30 years. They fall victim to just accepting that. And I want you to, I want you to ask one question further. Okay. And that is, what if they've been doing it wrong for 10 years? What if they've been doing it wrong for 20 years? What if they've been doing it wrong for 30 years, their whole life? So your experience, it it doesn't mean crap to me. And I want to hear some real world examples, right? You're not helping the conversation if you are one of these people that is throwing that out there. I, I, it instantly puts people on their heels. So, like, this was an email I got. This was an email interaction. It was not written by me. It was written by um, this other engineer. <laughs> not naming names, but I think it's it's worth a share. Trusses are the best option for this hip proof. I've been designing houses throughout Colorado for 32 years and have never designed a stick option for a hip proof. Um, in Summit County, we stick frame 90%, 90% of the roofs, but they're all gable end roofs with ridge beams. So... That didn't help the conversation because you know what it did? It put the contractor on his heels and they instantly got into a into a measuring contest. You know the word I, I omitted there, right? Then, it's a pattern. It's like, why is this pattern occurring this week to me? I swear to God, it's like uh, when, when, you, when you recognize these things, it's like, okay, we got to address this because I guarantee if I'm seeing this pattern, you maybe are seeing this pattern. Al Gore is hearing this pattern. I, I've had an example. Um, I've had one person who has a bunch of experience, does great work. The difference is they just do it differently. They said chases for HVAC never work. And we're like, what are you talking about? Never. You never. know, like that, that's the, the, it's the absolute language that you need to just get triggered by. It triggers me. I, I can't stand the absolute every time, you know, like every time you do this, it's like, wait, 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 come on. Nobody does something almost every time. Like, uh, stop that. Yep. I think you're right. It could be softened. And maybe it's you giving the 30-year experience. Like, I've been doing this for 30 years. And, blah, blah, blah. and trust me, I am tempted to do that. Yep. I am tempted to do that and say, like, yeah, but I've been doing this for 12. Like, I'm tempted to do it, and I always have to refrain from just doing that. And, and I'm backed up, meaning of um, when someone's asking or you're giving advice, it's... You, I think you can, I think the way to say it is, um, Hey, in my experience, uh, I think, I think the way to do this is that's blah, a good blah, way blah. in my experience, but you're this, not, and, and yes, this is what I would recommend or this is what I would suggest. See, see if they can do this, see if they can add this service, see if or, they can or, do, or, well, what we've done before is uh, a solution like this. It's worked on this project. It might work here. I don't know yet, but let's talk about it. I've had this That's advice even better before because you, you're not even saying experience. You're just saying like, I've just done this before. It seems like it worked. One of the, the, my uh, best advice that I think that I give to the younger people that are out on the job site or talking to contractors is, is literally ask for their advice. And the most receptive and I've ever opi- been and their opinion Yep, is, oh, what I've done before. I've heard that out in the field. And it's like, oh, okay. I, my ears literally perk up, do the opposite of get defensive. Oh, oh, what you've done before. Okay, great. 
uh, that's not going to work in this situation. Can we do it exactly. slightly different? And they're like, uh, yep, that, yep, that will work. I'll do it slightly different. Bam. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to give you one more example. And th this is in particular to architects, but I really think you can apply this to other people, right? So let's say you send over a proposal to somebody after you met with them for whatever service you're going to perform for them. And at the end of the conversation, they say, okay, great. I'll have my uncle look. Who's, at, who's been an architect for 30 years. A, that should be a red flag for you. I think you still go forward with sending the proposal, especially if you have a template like we do and, and we're, we're basically honing that template and it's not taking you an extraordinary, uh, extraordinary amount of time, including the email template that I've talked about before you should have ready to go, email templates. Then be prepared for the following. That person is going to forward your proposal onto the uncle who's had 30 years of experience as an architect and ask him to take a look at it. Still a red flag. Here's the response that I saw. The fee proposal amount appears to be reasonable. I would ask if they're going to provide a landscape design questions with the site plan. Are, are they doing mechanical, electrical, and plumbing locations in their plans? Or if they are subbing them out and what an estimated cost would be. A house around here would be 2,800 for MEP design. The architect hourly fee is higher than around here, but US Coast types cost more than us flyover folk. I would still argue that we're technically flyover folk, um, even though we're the West Coast of the Midwest. Anyway. Ah, there you go. I, would, uh, I believe that that's true. I agree. We're yeah. the California of Minnesota. We really are. <laughs> no, no, seriously, in every way. Like, like we are. The fact is, we argue about burritos in Colorado. And if you are arguing about what is a good burrito, you are kind of West Coasty. Fair enough. Uh, anyway, uh, back to the response here. I would require the architect to put at least four site visits in the X price. I'm not going to tell you what we're going to proposed once uh one visit at framing to make sure your mep have no conflicts and that the blocking for finishes like cabinets handrails is installed one at mep rough in to make sure everything is where you want it one when finishes are being installed one at the end to review final construction with you and help with the punch list you will want their eyes on it since you won't be there all the time yourself i would assume you will have the structural engineer out there to review foundations framing and other structure related issues feel if you have any questions feel free to call blah the client forwarded that on to me and they said, this is my uncle's response to your proposal. He's been a professional architect for over 30 years. If you can provide a reasonable response, I will be happy to sign with you. I responded, thanks, our contract is as written. So think, I want you to think one step further again, right? I'm, that, that's what I'm trying to help everybody do here is like, okay, uh, if somebody gives you that whole thing about the 30 years, maybe they've been doing it wrong, Maybe, maybe even if they haven't been doing it wrong, maybe it doesn't apply to that situation. Maybe it doesn't apply to how you do business, right? <clears throat> and then think about if that client comes back to me and says, hey, no problem. I'd like to sign and work with you guys. I'm not going to sign this contract. And here's why. I'm going to be under the thumb and the scrutiny of that other architect the whole way through. Terrible working situation. I... I I didn't know that you were going to go there. Like you, this is more personal to you because it happened to you and you, you're a little worked up by it. <laughs> um, but I thought it was only about the 30 years and I go, that's not the biggest concern in this email. The biggest concern is you're going to have to deal with yes. like, Oh, I didn't think it. So I asked my uncle yes. and my uncle said this, and now I'm going to have to have an argument. And then all of a sudden I'm going to have to go into the nuances and explain why this is slightly different than his experience. And then he's going to have to judge who is correct and who isn't correct. And there might be some back and forth. That's the thing. And it's not that it's not, I guess it is to be honest that someone is quote unquote looking over your shoulder, but that would come with an extra headache fee. Like an extra, like it would just, it would just. I told my cost. wife last night. I said I want to charge him fifty k if his architect, <laughs> if his architect uncle's involved. Yeah, like and and micromanaging doesn't increase, uh, you know, the efficiency of a problem. It makes it go faster. Like you, uh, you literally cannot have some. It, it depends on the degree, but the more that they're looking over your back, the more it's just going to slow it down. The more you're going to have discussions and stuff like that. Unless you're literally. Here's the difference. Unless you're literally training someone and helping them out. We're not at that. We're not at that stage. So like th th that's what I wanted to bring up is a bigger concern than just that one sentence. But that one sentence alluded to like, I got this in my back corner. Yes. This is the answer. Yes. Um, yes. And, and exactly. But we didn't get there, guys and gals and everybody else listening. 
unless we took it one step further with our thought process. So just try to think a little bit deeper, a little bit more critical thinking, right? Architects are supposed to be good at this next level thinking, the ripple effects, right? Yeah. We harp on about the ripple effects. Okay, so that's our opinion of it, but I want to share with, with you guys Forbes' opinion of it, okay? Oh, interesting. So Forbes has this excellent article, and this I think this exactly one-to-one -one applies. You just gotta you just gotta change your mindset a slightly, okay? Because the title is why these things why these th three things matter more than experience in the job interview process. You are still interviewing for the job. That that's what I'm saying about the tweak okay. of your mental level. Okay. So in the article, one of the biggest lies that people believe is that the experience is that experience is the most important thing in the job interview process. True, experience can be vital. You wouldn't want to hire a surgeon without the proper education and experience, right, architect? I agree. You wouldn't, but whether this interview is for your first job, your ninth gig since 2013, there's always uncharted territory in a new opportunity, especially if it involves changing your title or your responsibility. That's something you haven't done before. By definition, that expansion goes beyond your experience. The good news is there are stories all around us of people who have overcome their circumstances and their experience to create something completely new. Maybe your interview skills need to expand as well, particularly if you want to discover new results in your career. Here's three things that matter more than experience in the job or gig or project interview process. How you can leverage these insights to create a fresh career experience for yourself. Okay, number one. Okay. Uh, trust. Whether you are looking for a babysitter, Al, for your children, yep. a brain surgeon, or a brand expert, you rely on trust more than experience. In a recent survey, PWC, I don't even know what that is, points out that our ability to trust is the biggest challenge that tech titans face. On a more personal level, consider the story of Tessa and Tim, a married couple, or in this case, Al and Annie, a married couple. Yeah. <laughs> with a two-year-old and a five with two-year-old and five-year-old sons i'm just gonna play along sure, with this that's what I got. they are interested in going out with some friends on a friday and they need a babysitter mm. their next door neighbor just moved in two months ago and she has advanced degrees in child care she's run a daycare center for 15 years in another state and she's available to babysit out okay okay however okay, sounds good across the street is where clarissa lives she's a 17 year old high school senior who the couple has known since she was in grade school. Clarissa is also available to babysit. So who do they choose? Okay, can I just answer? Yes. So like I've known like so we've known this girl since grade we've known this girl for like ten years. Yep. And she's a good girl. Yes. Probably. Yes. Let's just pretend she's good straight A yep, upstanding like model citizen. Yep. Yeah, of course her. Okay. That's so, who I say. Okay. So who the new neighbor with tons of experience? Nope. They go with who they know, Clarissa, because trust matters more than experience. So trust your gut and consider how you are connected to your next employer. Okay. So uh, go ahead. To go one level deeper, mm -hmm. think about when you are marketing, going for a job, getting your foot in the door. How do you establish that trust? And some people do it through, hey, um, some sort of connection. Meaning like research where that CEO is from. Research who that hiring manager is from. Where did, what the, the, where did the referral for you even to get into this meeting come from? Do they know someone that knows you? Do they, even yeah. like, hey, did they go uh, live in the same state as you? Like even, even though that's not a huge indicator, like that small thing. Did points, they honestly tell you something you didn't like to hear? For instance, this building is going to cost twice as much as you think it's going to cost. And... And did that give you a sense of integrity? Mm, that you're not. Yep. Yep. Gotcha. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, okay. Number two, resourcefulness. It is. It's the greatest human resource resource and ability to figure things out is something we all share. Your ability to identify and solve problems is the kind of experience that every employer really wants. It's resourcefulness that leads someone to find their next job or gig. Doesn't matter if it's doggy daycare, day trading, or Diego. You are on a mission of discovery in the job interview process. This is everyone that is un, under 30 should know that people over 30, not just myself, have the perception that the younger generation is not resourceful. I'm not and, saying and, it's and true. like uh, self-starting. Yep, and, and this is what I'm getting at. I was talking to different contract, literally multiple different contractors, and the, the collective feedback that I received was, 
I feel like they need a manual to do this. I feel like they need a manual to get this done. Mm-hmm. And I was talking about, hey, um, a, to a different contractor, should we order a Simpson tie and have them modify it? Or should we have the local person do it? And I was saying, well, okay, see how Simpson can do it. Because the local person, the contractor asked me, can't the local person just see what we need and modify this thing? And I go, normally, yes. Mm-hmm. But I could see it handing down to the person in the shop person in the shop is just trying to do whatever job like i need drawings i need dimensions i need all this stuff i'm not going to figure it out good to go just i told you with uh the windows a couple weeks back ago the the older gentleman said hey yeah we can do all this we can make all this work and then finally one of the bosses said like yeah he's done this for 30 years our field people don't do that like they don't know how to do that like this isn't going to happen that way Mm. you know what i mean like they're not just going to be out there and know how to do all this stuff yeah so somehow if you can indicate that that is huge and and the thing is here was an obstacle i didn't have any direct help this is how i plowed through and got it done yeah so maybe you're just kind of preparing for that question you know and however that question comes up yeah i feel like we should write this down and and ask how how were you resourceful in a situation where you didn't have help that is an awesome interview question yeah. I'm just going to try to what? take a mental note of that and keep that in my brain. What's one for trust? I don't know. We'll have to think about it. That's a good... Yeah. Uh, okay, number three. Uh, communication in the job interview process. Whoever tells the best story wins. Not by manufacturing some fiction, but by delivering resourcefulness in a way that's authentic, trustworthy, and powerful. Understand that there's really only one thing and one thing only that companies want in the job interview process or, or customers. Uh Solution providers, can you communicate the solution that you can provide? Notice carefully the wording in that question. If it looks like a chronological tour of your resume from birth till yesterday is the kind of information your employer needs, look again. Your history and experience might be informative, but are they compelling? Ask yourself some difficult questions. How does your story show us that you are a solutions provider? Can you communicate using um, this five-step story process? How, How... how you overcame obstacles in the past. Can you use your stories and anecdotes to help others trust in your ability to solve current challenges? And are you ready to tackle whatever future work has in store for you? Communicate your resourcefulness and you will build the kind of trust that leads to job or gig offers or more projects. I love it. I agree with, with everything that was stated there. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I hope, I hope that, I hope that little segment helped you. And because I I just guarantee you're going to, it just seems like inevitable. You're going to get this whole, well, my uncle, my brother, I've, whatever. Don't buy into it right away. Is there, so to give these people some, some credit to like, does their experience matter? Yes, at a certain point, but it's not the end all. That's it. That's it. That's, That's it. it. Well, transitioning Lance. Back to Lance here. <clears throat> Back to Lance. Uh, how do you prepare for a recession if either you are young or you're a little bit more experienced so I, in age. Yeah, so I, so I wanted to talk about this because I, I, on the heels of Al and I sort of forecasting and looking ahead here, um, I, 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 I'm agreeing with Al. Like, there's there's an intern, there's a, not an intern, there is a downturn a coming. It, it has to come. Like, there, there's no way there's not. It's not going to come. So how do you, let's say, I'm going to speak to two categories of people here just by age and ex- and again experience so let's say you're an entry-level architect and let's say you're graduating this may um of 2022 and you're going to get that first job and but you've been listening inside the firm and even though you're going to get that first job and you're moving all the way over to some big city 10 12 hours away just like alan lance did and uh, you you also know, you trust them and what you've been hearing. You've done your own research. And you're like, yep, there's a downturn coming. Mm-hmm. How can you prepare for it when you don't own the company? You have uh, you aren't you don't, probably don't have the ability to bring in new clients and stuff like that. Here's how you do it. You need to build those relationships with people that you meet with at the firm. And I'll give you one example. Hmm. The one example I have is our good friend Brian Tinker, and one and our literally the one of the best contractors that I that I've known, one of the best guys that I know. He built. If you're interested in what he's built for us, if you go to uh, uh, if you go to our website and you look at the Eastwatch project, if, or if you just Google Google Eastwatch House cover of Builder Magazine, yep. right? So he knows he knows what he's doing. Um, 
one of the first houses that I ever did in Colorado when I was working for the other firm that I got laid off from. I made sure, Brian, I made sure that every single person I met with, if, if it was a, if I was in a design meeting, it was the client. If I was in a um, preliminary construction administration meeting, somebody like Brian. When I met with, when I met with Brian, I made sure to start establishing a good relationship with him. It wasn't a sucking up to him, but it was, I was trying to show that I was resourceful. Trustworthy. Trustworthy. And you could communicate. And I could communicate. Oh, look at that. And I was looking, in, and I w- what I did is I pointed out a few things regarding uh, the structure, how things were going together, how the construction would work. And then I talked about my background, not gloating, but just that, oh yeah, I used to, um, I used to frame houses. Yeah. And, and, and he really appreciated that and I resonated with him. I got laid off. We, I went my separate ways from that firm. Sure enough, Brian and I kept in touch the whole way. Mm-hmm. And now we refer work back and forth. It is so, cr- that long-term 18-hole game of life, is ex- yep. that's exactly that example. So if you're young and you don't have a lot of clout, you can still develop those relationships. Don't forget to write down those emails. Don't forget to write down those phone numbers. And once you're in, once you do get laid off and you're in trouble, those are the people you, you start reaching out to and start building other relationships with outside of that firm. Yep. Here's another suggestion. Let's say you're like, oh, Lance, I'm not as cool as you. I don't have a Wario ma- mustache. <laughs> 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 I don't have Italian uh, olive skin. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I maybe. And, you're and, literally Wario, Lance. But, and it might, like, I've been at, let's just go at, at a different level. So you're a big firm like Leapskin and like there's multiple people and you are the lowest on the totem pole and you might even be in the back chairs. There's like 30 people in this meeting. Yep. And I'm just doing the extreme. So like it could be anywhere in between there. During the meeting, that person that you want to establish that relationship relationship with, there will be something in that meeting that like no one figures out or solves out. It's a loose end. It happens every meeting. There's going to be some loose ends. Some of those loose ends matter. Some of them don't matter. Some will be figured out in the field. Some is like, some we just forgot, whatever. Whatever that loose end or that interest that they had was like, hmm, let's say they just said, I wonder how that connection is going to work. And and the conversation still goes. Or, oh, I wonder where we're going to come in, uh, you know, for the, dig in for the street. And, and no one knows right away. You can get that person's email. You were probably invited. It's probably on your calendar. Follow up. Hey, I'm Alex. You know, I was I was sitting in the corner. I heard you talk about that connection detail. Um, I talked to John, and this is what we were thinking. Uh, just wanted to pass that on to you. Now you have an email. Now you helped them out. Now you showed that you were listening. They're like, oh, this Alex guy. He was listening, paying attention, and got me what I need. Seems like he's resourceful, <laughs> trustworthy, and he can communicate. Yep. If you are um, on the opposite side of the spectrum. If you're a business owner like Alex and I, one, you know, obviously we started off this podcast episode about talking about the importance of diversity of, of inco- streams of income, architectabuilder.com, making sure you're lean and mean, revitrocketship.com. Don't lose sight of that stuff, especially the multiple streams of income. So one, one and, and if everybody thinks like, ah, oh, Lance, make sure you're like, uh, I hope you're practicing what you preach, 100%. What I did this last uh, last week was I was retained, and I've been trying to bust into this work for a long time, is retained as an expert witness architect f- to help out um, other professionals who are getting litigated against from homeowners or whatever, right? That's another stream of income at a at a very at an excellent hourly rate and daily rate that uh, that we have now we have now done. Al is taking on a big building project. So that's the lesson for you guys is like, do not, once again, do not put your eggs in all, all in one basket. You just can't do it. It's irresponsible. Agree. Agree hundred percent. Yeah. Um, awesome. Let me, uh, on to you, Al. Yes. Sorry, everyone. So Kyle, uh, Rogler is an awesome listener and he sent, he sent a different perspective. Uh, which I'm going to read, and I think it's worth getting different perspectives, especially what we're talking about is the banning or the the shadow banning of gas, uh, natural, natural gas. gas pro- yep. Yep, pro- yeah, basically natural gas for homes, right? So I'll read this to you. 
Uh, on the whole, banning gas application in homes. One area that is overlooked is the safety aspects of gas line in homes. My uncle, uncle's home, 30 years worth of experience. <laughs> that's a callback, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. That's what that's called. <laughs> Had a gas explosion from their fireplace. And there was another house in the subdivision that had a gas explosion following a lightning strike. <clears throat> First off, I'm going to pause there and do a side note. After building multiple buildings, multiple units, and, and going through the whole stick frame process and seeing how dirty it was and all that, and everyone knows how a gas furnace works. Like, okay, there's a little light in there, there's a flame, heats up stuff, blah, blah, blah. Once it's put in there after that raw experience, I'm like, I can't believe that there's an open flame in this building that's made of wood. <laughs> like it's, it's kind of yeah, crazy. Like yeah. there's just a flame right yeah. there and just a bunch of gas. Well, I think it inter- seems crazy. Yeah. We've talked about this before. I think, I think this thing has ruined us in a lot of ways, right? I'm holding up a phone for everybody who's listening to terrestrially an iPhone, right? It's an iPhone 13 brand new. It's so polished and perfect. Yeah. And we forget about that. Like we are living in an imperfect world. What we build is, is going to be imperfect no matter how hard we try and uh, there's just this raw life that's around us. You yeah. Know? Yep. Also, side note, every like Tesla is made in a manufacturer. A lot of people used to talk about like the panel gaps that they have. They fixed that. Yeah. 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 You think like cars should be pretty much perfect. So they were tearing down a Tesla, one of the new models. And <clears throat> basically they have this connection bar from side to side. And one had more washers than the other side. And the, the old guy that has over 30 years of experience goes, oh, that's because they're using aluminum. And aluminum has inconsistencies in it. And that's what's going to happen versus like a steel structure. So it's crazy that even these manufactured things like, what do you mean there's more washers on one side than the other side? Tesla is by far the most technically advanced car there is out there 100%. in the United States. It even happens there. Anyways, <clears throat> um, they're going back to Kyle. And Kyle was not here to defend himself, so we're going to take full advantage of that. Okay. There are also health concerns of burning gas in the home with VOCs, and several homes do not have proper air ventilation. <clears throat> yeah, especially if you're going to do passive house. And then, I think banning gas applications is going to be a trend. It will not be as much as simple to switch out, uh, but making up for the lack of gas by increasing air tightness, improving fresh air supply. Those are two separate things, Kyle. Uh, R values and thermal parts of, uh, of the home. Uh, he also thinks that some of it might be environmental you know, vendettas. Yeah. So I actually agree with him about like, it is kind of crazy that we just have an open flame heating our house. Sure. Right. But I, but I, and, and there is a trend towards pure electric houses. I also understand that too. I also want, I'm even don't want just solar panels. I also want like the Tesla roof now with my house. Like I am convinced I want a Tesla roof just all simply Simple, elegant. I'm going to capture water off it. It's going to be awesome, yep. right? <clears throat> but I have a owner who he built a house for who has solar panels right now. And he said, he just, we were just talking and he goes, hey, you know, I like the solar panels, but definitely with the snow, they're less efficient with the snow on them. And that happens in Colorado. Think about Minnesota, all this other place. So I would like a house that is purely run off of solar panels. If, if, if I could afford it and if it could work, that's actually what I really, really want to do. But that's not going to be everyone. And here's my question is when the solar, there is still going to be, it is not going to be possible in the next 10 years for everyone to power their house by solar panels. Where are you getting the extra fuel from? Okay. It's going to, from the power company. Mm-hmm. The power company can't do all solar panels either just because of the things that I said right right there. So they're going to use coal plants, nuclear plants, or natural gas. Well, they're not making any nuclear plants anytime soon. I mean, that's a issue. fact. That, this, is my, this, is the, this, is, this is my whole issue with the, art, with, with the discussion is it's not even a discussion. Like, we're not even allowed to have a discussion. Like, when are we going to recognize reality of you, you can't just do solar and wind. Like, you can't just do that. Yeah. It, <clears throat> Go uh, do as much as you can. Fine. I'll just run with it. Like I'm like I'll accept that, but good lord, we need a diversified 
This is the same people that scream diversity all day don't want it. I don't understand it. Yeah. So um, we're not doing nuclear isn't coming anytime soon, even though there's some promising things. We can all look forward to it. It's going to be awesome if it actually happens. Great. Love it. <clears throat> um, natural gas you just banned. Uh, the other ones are wind and hydro. Wind is only, I mean, hydro is only in certain location. Wind is actually only in some certain locations too, even though you can transport, but then you're losing efficiency. So coal, you're literally saying, I, I, I feel like you're saying we don't want natural gas because of these reasons. Some of them are valid reasons, but right now you're replacing them with coal. Doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. If, if you just made a new nuclear plant and you said we're banning gas and you literally just made these ones and it's a small one so you can keep adding, I'd be like, all right, it's hard for me to argue. Yeah. Hard for me to argue. Some people might want it just because they like to cook and stuff like that. And I was like, okay, we are going to be in the future sometime, yep. you know? Yeah. So that's, that's, uh, I know Kyle can't defend himself. I do appreciate him for bringing up these points. And thanks for letting us share the comment too, Kyle. Really I didn't ask it. him. Oh, okay. So he'll hear about this when he hears about it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Hopefully we don't get, okay. Uh, anything else? Uh, no, that's it for me. That's it for me. That's it from him. You know, what's not it from though. I know a guy down in Florida. He's got, he's got something to say. Let's hear him. All right. Here's Nick with Nick Reeds. Hello, best friends. I hope you all had a great week this week. A reading. Racism exists, but it's far less rampant than ignorance. And ignorance can be cured through experience. Candace Owens. Toodles. Wow, right back to the experience again. Yeah, but now it's flying in the face. Experience matters, Lance. It does, but Listen. it's not the end all. That's the whole point. No, that's what Nick yeah, said. Experience I, I, is the end all. Lance, you can kick rocks. I can that's kick what rocks. I heard. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, slash Nick, slash Candace Owens. There we go. You beautiful, beautiful lady. Speaking of experience, it's always good to get experience in ARE questions. So let's play ARE Jeopardy and bring down the crew. All right, you guys ready? Uh, question number one. The architect sees an issue with the concrete form placement on site. Which is the most appropriate action? Is it A, to direct the concrete worker to move the concrete forms? Is it B, to direct the concrete company's manager to change the forms? Oh, you're carrying on the con on the concrete site, huh? Cool. Yep. Let me C, see the manager. Uh, Stop telling other people what to do and move the form work yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Reba? Extreme ownership. <laughs> or D, uh, report the observation to the contractor and or the owner. Extreme ownership. What would Jocko do? What would Jocko do? Oh, you guys all said D. That is correct. Jocko would say C. Thank the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Question two. Basement window egress sill height is at a max of how many inches from the floor is it a 60 inches b 54 c 36 d 44 looking at katie she just learned this putting her on the spot all right uh d's have a majority at 44 it is d correct good job Okay. <laughs> what do we what do we have? Do we have all twos? Nope, one one. Architect. No. <laughs> Add someone else. Ah, uh -huh. we'll give her a pass. She's not licensed. Yeah. Number 3, the surviving written book Architecture, D Architectura, was written by whom? Is it A Da Vinci, B Marcus Vitruvius Polio, C Pablo Picasso, or D Marcus Pollock? So does that mean the architecture Your license of architecture? depends on this. You must life safety. Know it. <laughs> yeah, it's not even worth repeating. It's just guessing, right? Honestly. I mean, some people might know. Okay, what do we got? B, A, A, B, D, whatever. Mm -hmm. The correct answer is B. Yay. It's so it's basically Vitruvius. So now what do we got for scores? Who has we got three, 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 three? Oh, who has three besides Tyler? Okay, we're over here now. Okay, okay. getting close. Only one person can get this correct. Number four, who was called the father of skyscrapers? 
It is not Al Gore. A, Mohenjo Daro. B, Lewis Henry Sullivan. C, Vincent Van Gogh. D, Frank Lloyd Wright. You could have made that more difficult. This actually should... Really? That was a layup. Yeah, layup. Yeah, yeah, this is a layup. Oh, for sure. We got the answer is B, 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 B. The correct yeah. answer is B, Lewis Sullivan. You should have put like uh, I think we're SOM, on. Philip Johnson, like. Yeah, I could have made it harder. Um, <laughs> Just ripping into you. Okay, tiebreaker. Who has the tiebreaker? Who wants to read it? First one to get it correct. Who, so it's 3-3, three, three, Reeves. Yeah, four. Or 4-4, four, oh. four, 4 and 4. This is the tiebreaker we're just between you, you two? No, no. Huh? Okay. What'd you say? Nope. Oh, three. Okay. Speed, Game on. It's a speed round. So I need you to write this down and show me it. All right? A restaurant would be classified as which occupancy group? I know. I know. I know. It actually, it, it actually depends. I know. I know. Come on. That Jeez, I just guess. Allow. Nope. What know. else? A, A what? two is correct. A two. Tyler wins. Go to Runza. Runza. Go to Runza. Uh. <laughs> if it's under 50, I believe it can be B. It could be. So. <laughs> well. Who said it first? The first time. Well, you're going to Runza, so like, <laughs> can you win harder? I don't think so. Okay, <laughs> yeah. you both get a pick together. You have to decide together. Uh, that's it for me, Lance. If you like this episode, please share it with a friend, uh, colleague, your mother. If you're listening to Resterly, leave us a five star review on you on the iTunes. If you're watching on YouTube, please like, subscribe, and leave us a comment. We'll see you next week. 